Well, welcome to my LinkedIn profile. I'm super excited to have joining with me today, Ian Stafford. Now, I've been worried about this the whole time because I've only met you over the last couple of years. You're a multi-award winning journalist, a multi-award winning broadcaster, and just an all-round nice guy. There's so much to talk about. Who is Ian Stafford? That's the title of this LinkedIn post. I've got to know you pretty well over the last couple of years and watch the amazing sporting club, which we'll talk about in a, in a short while. But I want to wind the clock right back. You become a, a Fleet Street journalist at 22, right there. But before you get to there, where's your thought process? And by the way, welcome. <laughs> I thought it was very kind of you. I was very lucky. My mother was a, was a journalist in the 1960s at a time when there were very few female uh, journalists, national journalists, Fleet Street for for all you kids out there, uh, was the home, the Mecca, the Wembley of journalism. And I was really lucky because at the age of 14, I already knew what I wanted to do. I mean, how many 14-year-olds know that? Uh, apart from those who want to play for, you know, Manchester United, which probably isn't going to happen. So I already knew what I wanted to do. So I became the school magazine editor. I then went to King's London to read history. But the main reason why I went to King's um, London was it's – Apart from LSC, it's the nearest place to Fleet Street. And I used to walk down Fleet Street as a 19-year-old, 20-year-old going, wow, there's the Daily Telegraph building. Wow, there's... Every building was was a newspaper. I got to know a few journalists. I became an editor of the London University magazine. I, I did everything you were supposed to do, ticked all the boxes. But it should have been quite a long journey to get into national journalism. But I took a, I took a shortcut. And the shortcut was... Well, actually, it was funny because I had three years of being a penniless student in London. London was expensive then, it's expensive now. And I blew all my grants in the first term. I was like Billy Lyre coming down to London. It was like amazing because I was a Lincolnshire lad. Um, and um, I had no money. So I got wooed by uh, United Biscuits, who are a massive food company, um, a thing called University Milk Round. They go round and, and they try and snap up the so-called cream of uh, the country's young talent. So technically, if I go to King's College London, we were the cream of, uh, of young talent. I'm not sure we really were. So I literally, after three years of being penniless, I used to be a busker on the tube. That's how penniless I was. Uh, guitar and sang. Well, we could case, do a duet sometime, yeah. We could do. We very much. We could be the new Simon and Garfunkel, <laughs> couldn't we? Um, but anyway, um, I, 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 I got slapped up as a marketing executive for United Biscuits. And what did it for me was a Ford Escort. I did some training in Cornwall, by the way. Did I went down really? to Cornwall and did training there. Um, and £14,200, which in 1985, to me, seemed like an absolute bloody fortune. Sure. And it took me two months to realise it was a really good early lesson in life. What have I done? I don't want to do this. I want to be a journalist. That's what I want to be. And I, I quit. It's not the first time I've, I, I, I've quit. I quit. And then I wrote to a, uh, a magazine that had just started called Sports Week. It was uh, launched by Robert Maxwell and it was designed to be the UK's version of Sports Illustrated, which is the, the sports bible in, uh, in, in America, it's, it's, a, it's a magazine. And they used the best British sports writers on it. So I had zero right to be involved there. But anyway, I wrote a letter. Those days we wrote letters. Indeed. And then I wrote another, and then I wrote another, and then I wrote another. And I wrote 12 before I got a reply, which was in the nicest possible way, told me to F off. Mm -hmm. So then I phoned up their office and managed to get hold of a Welsh sub-editor called Roger. And I said, Roger, tell me everything there is to know about this editor, who's also called Roger, believe it or not. And he told me everything and said, right, put me over to him. And he goes, what, now? He goes, yes, put me over to him now. So he put me over to the editor and said, hi, Roger, it's Ian here. Who? You know, the guy he keeps writing letters to you. Who? What? What? Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what do, what do you want? But I've got a meeting tomorrow directly opposite your office, directly opposite. For the sake of five minutes, can I just come in and say hello and shake your hand? Now, that wasn't strictly true, by the way. But anyway, he went, oh, yes, yes, go on then. So I went in there for five minutes and I left an hour and a half later with a job. The job was office gopher. It was doing bits and bobs and mainly just being the servant to everybody. But my foot was in the door. And then I just started to, you know, because I, I, 
I was a good writer. Mm. Um, mm. I started writing bits and bobs and then half a page and then a page. And then my big break was um, somebody was ill. So they sent me out to Ireland, which at the t- time seemed very exciting and exotic to cover the Tour of Ireland bike race because Greg LeMond had just won the Tour de France. Greg LeMond was American. They all hated him in France because he gate crashed the French party. And I went to, to try and do an interview with him. I didn't know how it was going to happen. But anyway, I'm driving around, being driven around the whole of Ireland, watching this bike race, and I needed to, uh, uh, a comfort break. So they dropped me off down a lane and I said, another car will pick you up. And I know I was in the uh, in the high straw and waving in the wind, and I suddenly heard this <coughs> behind me and the sound of a bike and brakes. And I turned around, and Greg LeMond, the Tour de France winner, had quit the race he was tired. It was too soon after the Tour de France. He didn't know why he'd entered it. And he pulled down the same lane that I was having a pee in. <laughs> and uh, I went, Greg, well, once I'd finished what I was doing, obviously. Um, Greg, um, nice to meet you. Long story short, I interviewed him there and then. Filed the, the, the report, sent it back. They couldn't believe that it happened. And, um, and then uh, I started writing regularly for that magazine. Six months in, it went bust because everything Robert Maxwell did went bust. Um, and then I was I was like Yossa Hughes in Boys of the Black Stuff. I was in the Fleet Street pubs. I mean, this sounds like another era. This sounds Victorian. I was in the Fleet Street pubs, literally prodding every sports editor I knew, saying, I can work for you, I can work for you, I can work for you. And within a couple of months, I was writing regularly for The Times, for Today Newspaper, which has come and gone, mm-hmm, for The I Express. Remember. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I made a big enough or small enough name. I mean, there were days when I had three bylines in three different newspapers and I became known as a very prolific sports writer. And then the guy who was at the magazine who I picked up the phone and got the job out of him, um, he moved to the Times. He then offered me a, 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 a you know a proper job there. He then moved to the Main on Sunday um, and uh, I became a, a sports writer. And then, and then my next break was in 1989, I went over to Poland with the official FA tour to report on the rampant hood- hooliganism that there was there. And I, I had my head shaved. I did some fake tattoos on me. And uh, I didn't look I my best. Imagine. I didn't look my best. But anyway, the, the, the crux of the story was where we went in... Um, Katowice. It was a World Cup qualifier, England versus Poland. It was also very close to Auschwitz. Mm. And a lot of the uh, uh, so-called England fans who were handing out BMP and NF literature um, said, oh, Auschwitz, just let's go to Auschwitz. So I went with them, having to be very careful not to be seen to be encouraging them to do anything. I didn't need to. They were standing on the gas chambers doing Nazi salutes. Yeah. So I took some photographs. I went back. I wrote about it. It was read out in the House of Commons. Um, I won, at the time, the youngest ever person to win Sports Journalist of the Year. I had six months of uh, death threats and, and hate mail. And um, I was off and running. So that, th- And then from that, I had the most glorious time going all over the world, covering every meaningful major event there is. But more importantly, interviewing all the stars. That's why I have the Black Book. And that's why today... I interview stars on stage. I've just transferred the skill set from print onto stage. And I've just basically lost over 30 years of covering every major sports event. It, it was, you know, there's an old saying, I think Confucius first said it, was that if you enjoy your job, you never do a day's work, work in your life. life. Yeah. And I know you enjoy your, your work as well, Shane. So it was an absolute privilege to sit in the best seat in the house at the Olympics, at the World Cups, and then to sit down as I am with you now, and having a great conversation with Roger Federer or, mm. you know, I mean, you, Michael Schumacher, Tiger mm. Woods, mm. whoever it was. Mm. And all that, I will get onto the sporting club, I'm yeah, sure, in a we bit. Certainly will, uh, yeah. But all that was sort of, um, was background to how I, I'm now able to have the beck and call of nearly every star sure. and get them involved. But then the other thing was all the participatory stuff I did with all these stars, and that really helped. But you see, the running theme here, the philosophy is never, never give up, right? Be persistent. Keep going. Because people look at your success now. God, look at Ian. But success, even though you achieved good success at 22, um, in what you wanted to do, it doesn't come overnight, right? So it's a lot of learning. We were talking before we started recording. It's all about learning. We make a few blinders mistakes along the way. 
you know, so the philosophy, would you agree, is just never give up, be persistent, keep knocking on the doors. It's my favourite quote. Uh, look it up, uh, people. It's from Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc was the man who turned a couple of little diners into the McDonald's global mm. franchise. Mm. And um, it's quite a long quote, so I'll, I'll, I'll summary. Mm. Um, it was along the lines of um, uh, persistence and determination are the greatest assets in life. Um, talent is not enough. The world is full of uh, wasted talent, education is not enough. The world is full of educated derelicts. Um, uh, persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. I love that quote. And I can relate to that. I've yeah. not heard that, but it make, makes absolute sense to Never, me. Never, ever give up. Mm. Even when everybody else around you gives up on you. Okay. Absolutely. Always back yourself. And, and, by the, and if you do succeed in what you do, the pleasure isn't telling other people to, you know, go forth and multiply. Mm. You don't need to do that. The pleasure's yeah. inside. You're doing it for yourself after all. Absolutely. And your family, you're not doing it for, for the, for the doubters. Mm. Now you've also found time to write 23 books. Is yep. that right? 23. Yep. And counting. You know, and uh, I mean, I listened to that. I think, goodness me, for me to write one book, I think would take me forever. You know, so how, how do you focus your energy and your time on that? Obviously you've got a mind full of information, Yeah, but, but talk to me about that. Well, I, I have the, uh, b- b- back in the day, people thought I was incredibly clever and foresighted to become a sort of a multimedia figure. Uh, because now I tell everybody, and I've been telling people, a lot of people come to me for advice in the media. And I say, you cannot do one thing. You have to be multi multimedia. But back then it had nothing to do with my intelligence or, or the foresight. It had everything to do that I have the intention span of a gnat. So I love to be very, very busy. So I used to love looking at my diary on a Sunday and say, what have I got on this week? Well, I've got a big newspaper interview on Monday. I've got a radio show uh, I'm hosting on Tuesday. Um, I'm spending the day uh, writing my book on Wednesday. I've got lunch with an agent on Thursday. I like it to be very different and very and very busy. Me too, yeah. And, and I also strive for new challenges. So as a writer, I remember the first time I wrote a big article, which was a thousand words for a national newspaper. It took me all day and, oh, this is a lot of words. And then that became normal. And then you started writing big magazine articles, like 3,000 words, 4,000 words. And so the next step up was to write an 80,000, 100,000 word book. For me, it was, it was, it was another challenge. It was another string to, string to my bow. Um, some of them were shamelessly uh, financial arrangements. Others were, were um, absolute works from the heart. The, the, the ones I'm proudest of by a mile are my four participatory books where I actually played sport with or against some very, very famous individuals. And the reason for doing it was to A, tell their story, but B, also represent so many of us who sit at home with a bottle of beer in our hand and say, I could have done that. Yeah, How do. did he miss yeah. that goal? How did he drop that catch? I was pretty good at sport, uh, believe it or not. I played county at three or four different sports. I was first team school. I was like the second or third best in the team. So I was good, but I wasn't. The best one went on and actually achieved something in sport. Um, so I wanted to, uh, and also one of my literary heroes was a guy called George Plimpton, who was part of that American literati. Him, Norman Mailer, Hunter S. Thompson. Absolutely love all that whole sort of era of, of American writing. And Plimpton did a similar thing, but he did it just in the States in the 60s. And I wanted to branch out. So the first one, Playgrounds of the Gods, it gave me an opportunity. The Playgrounds of the Gods are the sports fields, okay, um, inhabited by the sporting gods. So I went to Brazil and hung out with a Flamengo, who are like the Manchester United of Brazilian football. And as, as a result, it was able, I was able to sort of say how, you know what, Copacabana Beach, it's out there. It's free. The sun's free. It's all free. Go out there and see the thousands and thousands of talented kids escaping the favelas and coming down and playing football in the hope that they'll be the next Romario. They'll be the next Neymar. Maybe the next Pele mm. could, could be that. Well, the answer is they are. They're all, they're all there. And it's a similar story. When I ran with the Kenyans, I ran in the 3,000 metre steeplechase, national trials, 9,000 feet above sea level in the, in the Rift Valley. Me and, uh, me and uh, eight, eight top Kenyans, 15,000 in the stadium, uh, two white guys, me, I mean, it was like out of a film, me and a, and a white Irish priest called Brother Colum, who had a who had a mule, and he was a local athletics coach. Everybody else was were, were, were Kenyans, uh, cheering me on. Um, I was a substitute for the Springboks against Ireland. I was twelfth man for the Australian cricket team against New Zealand, and came on. Um, and uh, I remember my agent I, when I came with to him with the idea 
He completely poo pooed it and said, well, you're not going to do that. I went, okay. So I went back about four months later and showed him the first three chapters. And he went, okay. And then I got a deal and then, then I finished it. And I won an award for it and it set me up uh, to, the, to do the others. Quick story, if I may, about the Kenyan experience. Real analogy for life, this. So when I finished, Kip Kaner was there. Kip Kaner was the godfather of African running. He won uh, Olympic gold medals in 68 and 72. He was like the David Beckham of Kenyan sport. Okay. And he invited me over to his house the next morning. Now, don't forget, I'm there creating content to write a great book. So, of course, it'd be, wow, to get Kip Kaner to invite me over. And he, it was an orphanage, and he ran an orphanage. And uh, inside, he gave me... Uh, uh, an African water gourd. You can get them in, in markets. They're, they're, they cost about two quid. A little sort of water gourd with some leather, multicolored beading. And uh, it, it's, it's worth nothing. Uh, it, it's it's two, two quid in a, in a market. Mm -hmm. And he gave it to me. I said, what? Why are you doing this? And he said, because this is your prize. And I went, oh. And he goes, because you entertained me. You made me laugh. And I went, well, I wasn't me trying to make you laugh. I, fell in, I actually fell in the water jump at one point. We had 15,000 uh, uh, shouting, Gumazunga, Gumazunga, which is white guy in, in Swahili. And they're laughing and, and they absolutely loved it. Um, and I said, well, I didn't really need to make you laugh. He said, no, he said, but more importantly, he said, you finished. You finished. And uh, I respect that. And he gave me this water cord. And the point of the story is, uh, like, if I had a fire at home, that would be one of the first things I would save because you could buy it for two quid in the market. It's worth nothing. It's worth everything. Sure. It's the old Oscar Wilde quote about, you know, the problem with you is, you know, the price of everything and the value of nothing. It's price is nothing, but it's value is everything. And I've got loads of, loads of stories like that. So anyway, that, that, so I started doing these books and that, and that one particularly proved very successful. I was able to, oh no, I think that the clincher was <laughs> I learned to box uh, in a, in a canning town gym, you know, pretty rough and ready. And then I went over to America and did three rounds against Roy Jones Jr., who at the time was the world light heavyweight champion. He became the world heavyweight champion. He'd previously been super middleweight and middleweight. He was the best pound for pound boxer in the world. And I did three rounds against him in Pensacola, Florida at midnight. And there were pictures of me, uh, apps. It looks like somebody's got a ketchup bottle and splurted it all over my face. Blood everywhere. Um, and uh, that made an impact and um, people couldn't believe I did it. He couldn't believe I did it because mm. it, it wasn't a stunt. It, it couldn't be. It does, none of these are stunts. They're stunts. It doesn't work. Um, and I was able to, I, I found it a very creative experience. Actually, I wrote 15,000 words for that chapter uh, in a day, a long day, but in a day, I barely left my seat. I couldn't get the words out quickly enough because there was so much emotion from anger to humiliation, to fear. That's amazing. Because yeah. I, I was, he was pounding me and there was nothing mm. I could do. Mm. So yeah, I'm very proud. That one particular, I'm very proud of. But then the, the follow-up was an all UK version. So I played rugby league for Wigan Warriors. I played football for Everton in a pre-season friendly. 22,000 people at Goodison Park against Manchester City. We won one nil. Everton always win when I play for them, by the way. <laughs> Is that right? um, and I ran in the 60 meter sprint in my leotard live on grandstand. I would just like to point out, it was a very cold day that day, just, just so you know. <laughs> um, and then I did another one, which was called um, uh, In Search of the Tiger, which was a golf book, where it ended up with me and Tiger Woods. And then they did a fourth one called Who Do You Think You Are, Michael Schumacher. Mm. And it ended up with me and me racing against Michael Schumacher inside the Stade de France at the, an event called the Race of Champions. And there were 80,000 people there. And basically it was like time lap. So he did it. And then it started to rain and then I did it and I was surprise, surprise slower, but I made the point it was raining. So the conditions were worse. And Michael Schumacher, God bless him. This is why he was seven times world champion. He said, doesn't matter. All that matters is what it says in the record books. He actually cared that he beat me at the start of the fight, which, which I absolutely loved. So I'm very proud of not all, most, most, most of my books. Sure. And it's, it's another string to my bow. And it's like when I started to host events. I, I only started hosting events 12 years ago, whatever. And this is a real, another great life lesson. I did it because I wanted to add another string to my bow. And I wanted to test myself. And I remember when I started doing it, driving up and down the country, going to sort of like 
drunken rugger bugger dinners and I couldn't control the crowd. And, you know, my mindset would be, oh, whatever happens, I'll be back in four hours. Or sometimes I drive home thinking that went okay. Sometimes I drive home thinking I don't want to do this again. Mm -hmm. But this little stubborn voice in my head was saying, well, no, no, you're, you're not walking away. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. You keep doing it. And it's rather like when you're learning to drive and you keep stalling the car, then one minute, one day, bang, you don't stall. You found the biting point and you never look back. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what's happened with me. So, I mean, even, I don't know, six years ago, if I had a huge event I was going to host, I would be bricking it for weeks before. Now, I remember doing Usain Bolt in front of 1,200 people at the Grover House a couple of years ago, woke up, punch in the air. You know, I've got Gareth Southgate in September. Uh, I can't wait to sit on stage and, and talk to him. The thing is, that's how I've got to know you was through that and then found out about your amazing CV afterwards. Now, recently I've had Phil Tuffer, Tuffer's down in Cornwall, yeah. Phil, Phil Tufnell. And of course, when we're down there, I had to say, look, you must know Ian Stafford. And of course, he's like, of course I know Ian Stafford, you know. And uh, I got him on the phone, we was having a little chat and everything like that. And of course, I, I, not even being a massive sportsman myself, I'm just obviously aware of people like Tuffers doing commentary and stuff. Now, there's not a channel in sport that you've not been on or in TV or in radio. Uh, how did all that kind of transition from the writing and then getting the break into, you know, commentating and and uh, doing the broadcast and Well, I, 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 I got asked. I mean, when I won that uh, Sports Show of the Year, I, I, I got a gig on, um, was it Was it Going Live on Saturday Going Live, morning? yeah, yeah, with Sarah Green and uh, Sarah Phil Green Schofield. And Phil Schofield. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, a bit of Emma Forbes as well, if you That's remember. That's right, yes. So I had a slot called Time Out. I, I, had a, I did stuff on John Craven's News Round. Yes, I remember <laughs> I, that. I did quite a bit of stuff on uh, Grandstand and... Right. Um, uh, sports night with Harry Carpenter. Uh, this is going back a while. Uh, I even used to do quite a lot on sports on Friday, which was, which was, I was like the Reverend reporter and the presenter was David Icke. David Icke, before he me, started wearing yeah. turquoise, it became. That's right. And on that famous Wogan uh, yeah, interview. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what happens when people work with me? They, you know, they suddenly believe they become God and, uh, and wear turquoise. Um, so I, 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 like I said, I like to be busy. I like to do lots of things. I did a stuff on Big Breakfast, um, loads on Sky, mm. quite a lot, a lot on Five Live uh, and other shows. Uh, I, I wrote and narrated a few Radio 4 documentaries as well. And I had a show on Talk Sport up until about a couple of years, Sunday morning show. It was a bit of a killer, nine o'clock, but it was good fun for a while. And um, that's the thing about the media. Things come, things go all sure. the time. So I just, it goes back to what I was saying. I like to be busy. I, I think anything I do helps everything else that I do anyway. Sure. And all this experience has built up to the point now where I was able to launch a sporting club using all my skill set, using my um, really strong black book mm. and, you know, being able to, and at the end of the day, you know, whatever we do, we sell ourselves, don't we? Of course we do. When you're selling yeah. something, you start with yourself, mm. I think, is what you have Absolutely. to do. Whether you're a journalist um, obtaining the trust mm. of a sports star, I, I, I mean, a, the genuine trusts, which you, which you don't manipulate, which you then, mm. you know, use to their advantage and your advantage as well, or whether you're uh, securing members for a, a, a business club or whatever you do, you've got to, I think the ethos of, of whatever your business is starts with, starts with you. So I just reckon, I just thought to stay hungry, which I think is so important and stay passionate, which is even more important. I, I wanted to do something else that I've, in the back of my mind has been lurking for quite a while, which is, okay, all this experience, now put it into something uh, which has become the sporting club. Well, let me talk about that because I joined the sporting club just probably over a couple of years ago now after a very good recommendation from a business colleague and it has been absolutely superb and I say that because I'm still a member I still attend the events even though I'm from Cornwall coming up this way is a bit of a trek but I do make the um, pilgrimage to come up as often as I can we were recently together at a polo event quite an exclusive polo event in Windsor and when we turned up and we saw each other shook hands and was catching up there were so many sporting club members there and it's really refreshing what you've done with it. Um, and I really want to put this across because so many people on my business network see me at your events. And I'm like, Shane, this looks great. I said, well, look, please come along. Come along as my guest. Come and 
experience that feeling. And it really is all built on the relationships, you know, and, and the vibe. And I, using sport as a common denominator is absolutely mm. brilliant. And I'm not even a massive sports fan. Yeah. I like a bit of golf. You know, I like being involved in yeah. big matches. Like, you know, tonight as we're recording this, we've got the Euros, England's playing tonight. I'll be around watching that. Yeah. But it's just amazing the actual vibe that you get from mm. the members. It's mm. absolutely superb. So how would you demonstrate that um, to people watching this for the first time, what the sporting club is? So the sporting club is a business club, okay? But sport is the world's greatest common denominator. I mean, you could throw music into the mix if you like, but for me, it's the world's biggest niche and sport doesn't judge us on our wealth or background or, or religion or, or politics or, or size of bank account. It doesn't judge us in any of that. And I would challenge anybody to challenge that statement. Um, mm. So that's the first thing. Um, we have a series of club lounges all over the country, which our members hang out in. Very, very useful. Breakout rooms, boardrooms as well. But we like them to sit in the club lounges because then they can meet fellow members, et cetera. And I love it when members rock up to have a planned meeting for an hour and they actually stay for another hour because they've had a two or three impromptu meetings with, with other members. And that's happened to me many times. Yeah, exactly. And it's great to say, in some sense, they're better than the original reason why they're in the room. And then around that, we, we, we do events. And um, you just said that you're not a massive sports fan. And I, and, and I know that because you've of, often mentioned things that have made me eye roll at your <laughs> lack, your lack of sporting knowledge, but it doesn't matter because the I, I did a post on LinkedIn the other day, which proved surprisingly popular. And it was about uh, the young lad Saka uh, scoring a penalty, having missed a penalty three years earlier. The experiences of sports stars are analogies for life, okay? But they are magnified because they're in the public eye. We could have a, a successful entrepreneur, a, a business person in the room, and we could be having a discussion. But we don't know who these people are. But the sports stars, we have followed them. And their successes and their perceived failures, as I said, are magnified because of the um, the air and the platform that they're on, okay? Now, most people like sport. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. Mm, There's the old adage about, in, and when everybody used to read a newspaper, a lot of men, uh, there, was a, there, was, there, was some, uh, there was a survey, quite a big survey, and like 75% 70, of all men would say, I have a quick look at the front page and straight to the back and then work, work that way. So what I really like about interviewing sports stars is that we all know their story. And you've heard me interview sports stars. I, I don't care if you used a forehand or you used a backhand or you used your left foot or you used your right foot. What I do care about is when you are on the floor, how you got up and what you learned from that. And I, 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 a lot of my own ethos is so, I think because I've been in the world of sport for so long and I've, I've known so many serial, serial winners. I've just had a phone call. I'm not name dropping, but you, you know, I know these people. Steve Redgrave, who I rode with at Henry Regatta in, mm. in my book, Play Guns of the Gods. He's just been on the phone. Perfect example. That guy won five Olympic gold medals over a 20 year period, five different games. It was 40 when he won his last gold medal. One of the most grueling sports you can, you can do. Barely earns a penny for doing it. And by the way, for the last 15 years, had colitis, type A diabetes, and Crohn's disease. Good Three night. unbelievably debilitating mm, conditions, mm. right? But for him, didn't matter because he built up a no excuses environment, okay? He was a serial winner and nothing would get in his way. They were just excuses. And that's what I love about, I love about uh, uh, sports people. So um, that's why I really enjoy interviewing them. And you know, failure is, is not, failing when you do something. See, if this podcast doesn't work out, you haven't failed. You would have failed if you hadn't tried to do it in the first place. Correct. You've got to 100%. run towards the danger in life. In my, uh, just my own opinion, you don't have to follow my own views. These are my own views. You have to run towards the danger. And failure is not giving something a go, not giving it a go, and it doesn't work out. You know, and you know what as well? Failure it's just another stepping stone to ultimate success. A hundred percent. And that's what sports stars do. And that's why I love interviewing them because, you know, that comes over. And so when you come to my events, uh, I, and I probably, we don't have time for me to tell you all the things. Oh my goodness. I would all, love to speak to you all day. No, no, but, you, but you don't, we don't have time <laughs> for me to list all the things I'm bad at. Okay. Right. I'm horrendously bad and incredibly stupid at 
thousands of things, but I know how to interview somebody. You certainly And do. so, you know, um, to have them in the room and to have them talking about that is, uh, you can hear a pin drop. And, you know, we've had all sorts from very amusing, obviously very funny. It's not all, oh, you know, some of it's just entertaining and funny, but, you know, we've had Dame Kelly Holmes in the room talking about self-harming. Yeah, I was when, there for that. Well, one, do you remember yeah. that? Do you remember you could have heard yeah, a pin drop yeah. then? Good at you, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've had we've had um, Sugar Ray Leonard breaking down in tears, mm. uh, talking about, um, wow, I, I get emotional with thinking about it. Sure. Second ever professional fight. In the history books, not important, but mm. for him, the most important fight of his life. Why? Because... His mother had four menial jobs. His father was a waste of space. Classic American boxing story. Mm. Nobody chooses to be a boxer in life. Sure. But you have very, very limited life, life options. And after his second fight, it was a scene out of American Gangster. He told his mum, come here, I want to meet you here. She arrived there. He went, mum, you see that house? Here are the keys. It's yours. Amazing. And he broke down mm. telling that story. Mm. And people are there and like, my God, this is real. This is not sound bites. This is real. And so the events are really, really, we're not an event company. We're a club. But as you well know, loads of members come to the events. They client entertain, which is very important. It's great for that. And, and also it's great for being in the same room at the same time with loads of uh, like-minded people, fairly high up the food chain. Now, of course, the challenge we've had, I launched it in <laughs> 2018 and March, and we were to pick it up speed. And then March, 2020, bang. Have a bit of COVID. Whole world shuts down. Of course. So I was signing over a business with uh, venues that were closed, events which were shut down. We did stream stuff. I had a, I had a membership of about just under 300 by then. Mm. And so that was March, 2020. Uh, November, 2022, 20, it was like 72 members. Mm. Because, I mean, some sadly... Didn't make it. Sure. Uh, a lot of people retired. A lot of people relocated. A lot of people lost, I mean, lost 30-year family businesses. It was carnage. Um, and then we had to sort of, there's the analogy I'm talking about. Get up off the floor mm. and go again. And we didn't just lie there and take it. We actually improved a lot during COVID. We got loads more clubs, for example, all around the country. We created all sorts of societies. We did stream stuff. So we're actually a much better proposition at the end of COVID than we were at the beginning of COVID. But, but financially, it was incredibly challenging. And obviously, mm. we lost 75% of our members. Mm. But that was then, November 2022. Now we're nearly 500 members and, mm. you know, and everything, strength, everything's, strength. everything's going well. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here smoking the job done cigar. No, no. I barely got started in my own mind. Sure. Uh, we're hopefully about to go international. But it's just a lot of hard work. But I don't even see it as work. I love it. Indeed. And I'm very lucky that I'm still, um, you know, as- uh, Well, you've just did the cycle uh, thing the other day. I've just done a lot of the Paris bike yeah, ride, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you put so much into that. I remember all your, all your training. It's well, like, I fell I off think, my bike does- 10 days before, didn't I? I broke, my, broke two ribs. Well, people say to me all the time, Shane, where do you get your energy from? You know, how do you cram in all the things you do? Well, I'm nothing compared to you. I look at you and I think, goodness me, it's like this guy is something else. But- well, yeah, I, 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 listen, I, I'm a massive, massive believer, okay, but if, uh, when the time comes mm. and I'm lying there on my deathbed, hopefully in about 30 to 40 years time. Yes. And uh, mm. by the way, I have all these little sort of world of Ian, sort of like sort of Walter Mitty and I'm lying there and the priest, I don't know why a priest is there by the way, but anyway, the priest will say the doctor comes up to me and says, Ian, I think you've got, I'm sorry, you've got 10 minutes to go. I'm going to lie there and I'm going to go, damn. But then I hope I can go, well, you know what? You've given this a hell of a go. go. You've squeezed every last drop out of this thing called life. It's all you could ask for. Yeah. Now, this is just me. I, I always like to caveat this by saying, if you've been a, a librarian all your life and you're very happy and you're contented, fantastic, right? This is my ways and everybody's way. In fact, it's most people's. But for me, it's quite a tough being me because I'm very demanding on myself. and. When I do things, other people, when they do things, it kind of quenches their thirst. For me, it's the opposite. I actually want to do more and more. So that's just how I tick. It's not for everybody. So the librarian analogy, if you, listen, if you're content, really content in life, you've smashed it. Whatever you do, you've smashed it. Yes. I, I live by a definition of success. 
from Earl Nightingale, and that is the progressive realization of the worthy ideal. It's a great way of um, yeah. explaining success because it looks different for everyone. Yeah, yeah. But I, I remember, you know, I remember, sorry, I'll tell you a mm. quick story. Going back to that, um, going back to the uh, Kip Kano water gourd thing, okay. I was at a dinner party a few years ago, and I used to, I, I, I'm a very sociable animal, as you well know. But I used to oh, go to a dinner party, and my um, partner at the time, so are you just going to dominate this dinner party again? Okay? I went, well, I hope not, because I really don't want to end up talking about me. I, I just want to sit there. But what happened was that, oh, nice to meet you, nice to meet you sitting around the table. People get getting to their start. Of, what do you do? Oh, I'm an accountant. Oh, all right. What do you do? I'm a surveyor. What do you do? What do you do? Oh, well, I, I, I work in the media. Now, the problem with that is it, you can't lie and you can't be sort of, falsely sort of um, um, unresponsive. So you have to tell them what you do. Oh, what do you do in the media then? Oh, well, I, I do this. I do that. Oh, what area? Sport. Sport. And they all sit up. Well, do you know any sports? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know a few, yeah. Well, like who? And then that's it. And then they're all just bang, bang, bang. And that's the beauty of it, you see. So there was one guy sitting opposite me and he was nouveau riche. So the, the old rich don't really bang on about how wealthy they are, but the nouveau riche used to. Um, and he sits back and he goes, uh, so that bought playground, play, play, what was it called? Uh, playground to the God. How much, how much do you make for that? Uh, so he goes, how, how, much, how much did you make for that? I looked at him and I went, do you really want to know? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, millions. He went, what? Millions and millions. And millions. In fact, I can't even put a price yeah. on the experiences and the stories and the anecdotes that I've derived from writing that book. It's priceless. And you can see, look, I was trying to work out what, what I meant by sure. that. And eventually the penny dropped. Mm. And that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, 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 I'm blessed and I feel very wealthy. Mm. Not my bank balance. Sure. I'm the it's, same. it's the yeah. wealth of, of experiences. Yes. And you know what? If you don't have, I'm, I'm actually now um, over 40. It's a little bit of a shock to it is people, a shock. but I am a little bit over 40, a little bit more than a little bit as well. Um, and if you don't have stories to tell, mm. scrapes, sure. even yeah, yeah, yeah. anecdotes, when you sort of get to 50, what have you been doing with yourself? That's my own view. Absolutely. For me, life is all about experiences their intensity and their frequency. Yeah. And today is no exception. Every day is a school day as well, remember? It really is. And it always will be. It really is. And anybody who tells you, by the way, when they run a business, <coughs> I didn't go to the Harvard Business School. I, I just, I, I did go to university, as you know, read history, mm. but I, I'm a graduate of the University of Life, as we all are. So the, the sporting club, I never run a business before in my life mm. until six years ago. Mm. I made hundreds of mistakes. Okay. And anybody who says they haven't, I would suggest they be economical with the truth. Absolutely. Okay. And so progress when you're running your business is never that. No. It's that. Right. And when COVID comes in, it's, it's, and, and then up. Yeah. So, you know, I'll probably, st I'll definitely still make mistakes, of course. but learn from them. Try not to repeat them and try, try and avoid them, but just have fun. You know, the whole mantra of the sporting club, as you know, is the sporting club, good business, really important. Good people, massively important. Surround yourself by good people and good fun. Yeah. Because if you're not enjoying yourself, what the hell are you doing? Exactly. Well, I've enjoyed myself today. I could speak to you for hours. I'm really grateful for your time. I know you're super busy. You're always here, there and everywhere. And thank you so much for, for everything over the last couple of years. Your, your, your attention at the events has been absolutely superb. And, um, and just to be with you, you're good company. And um, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Shane. And it's been a pleasure staring at you and that shirt. <laughs> Do you know, well, I'll finish with this one. When I was at one of the events um, in M in uh, Threadneedle Street, you had John Barnes there, who was fantastic. You had him doing the rap and everything. It was absolutely of course. super. I was coming down the stairs and I get my shirts from a, um, a men's clothing place in Cornwall called Martin and Budge. And Give them a good plug. But Martin he, and Budge. Martin and Budge. And uh, it's the same brand that John... Um, Barnes wears. Yeah. So he said to me, he goes, 
he said, oh, is that a Claudio Lughi shirt? Yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, it is. So yeah. I haven't got that one. Yeah. And I think he's like an either ambassador for them or something like that. But yeah. yeah. And I was, I was like, my goodness me, John Barnes kind of, you know, spoke yeah. to me, you know. Yeah. And that was, you know, at your, one of your events, so yeah. the experiences. But no, it's been a pleasure. I've got to say a massive thank you to Jay, who's produced the podcast yeah. for well us done, as well. Jay. Absolute star. And also my thanks to Homegrown as well. That's where we recorded this podcast. But if you're not already a member of the Sporting Club, check it out connect with this man you won't regret it thank you so much thank you